Game four had lots of things happening that led to the Timberwolves pulling it out and extending the Western Conference Finals. Hot shooting from behind the arc, aggressive defense, a very controversial call or two. And I even understand why Wolves fans might be upset about this call. And a meltdown from Kyrie that might not be as bad as we thought. So let's jump right into it by examining what Carl Anthony Towns did to stop a dubious streak of three-point misses at 10. First off, it was surprising to me that he didn't even attempt a three-point shot in the first half. Early in the first quarter, Edwards is able to attack Gafford in the pick and roll and get to the dotted line. This forced Luka to rotate over, leaving Cat wide open in the corner, but Ant opted to shoot it and earn two free throws. This out-of-bounds play calls for Edwards to pin down for Cat for a potential three-point shot, but look how physical P.J. Washington is, forcing him back along the baseline and another opportunity missed. Sometimes this Iverson cut could open Cat up for a three, but P.J. goes under the screen and is right there on the catch. Cat could also get a three when he receives a flare screen from Rudy towards the top, but check how P.J. gets to the inside and blows that whole action up forcing Edwards to face up and isolate, which certainly goes well for them. The pick and pop is another very common set the Wolves use to get Towns open, and the Mavericks are switching these in order to keep a defender on him as he tries to spot up, so he keeps it moving. In an effort to be aggressive, he passes up a wide open three, only to commit a pretty clear offensive foul, so there's another opportunity missed. And here's that flare screen from Rudy that got him an opening to shoot a three, but instead he forces the issue. Now, he's using his left arm provocatively against Gafford, Washington hits his wrist to dislodge the ball, and everyone should be upset with this as Minnie comes away with nothing. Midway through the third, they call a simple pin down for Cat on the left side, and he uses unique footwork with the right foot plant on the catch, then the left foot plant to shoot off a pivot. PJ was right in his face, but it didn't matter as he nails his first triple. This was the same shot he took in the fourth quarter of Game 3 without the screen. Same footwork, this time it's the taller Gafford contesting, and he's off by only a couple of inches. Out of horns, they put Towns on the weak side high post, and one option is to have Kyle Anderson set a screen and Edwards hand off the cat out top. Going to his left is easier because there is natural right shoulder alignment. I love that he used the hop footwork to get his shot off quicker, but with Anderson wrapping up PJ's arms, he can't contest much anyway, and the shot drops through. This was similar to the last three he missed in game three, but the spacing wasn't as good. He hops into this shot as well. It was a bit of a desperation at the end of a decided game, and it was woefully short. Deep in the fourth, we have Kyle Anderson controlling the possession because he's in the best vantage point, deep in the weak side corner so he can see all nine players in front of him and the ball. He wants to set up the flare screen for Cat, knowing Edwards is going to attack Washington from the wing. Edwards needs to work on making more accurate passes, but the Anderson screen was so effective, Cat was still wide open on release, and this was a crucial make down the stretch. He plays off of Edwards again on his fourth make in a row, another crucial shot when Ant gets by Luka, and even though Derrick Jones Jr. is properly facing his man, he's late recognizing that Ant had kicked it to him, and he barely, and I mean barely, gets that right foot behind the line by a millimeter to earn that extra point and give Minnesota some breathing room. One reason Cat struggled in Game 3 was because of the effectiveness of the Mavericks switching. On this bread and butter pick and pop, Gafford leaves his man to get there, and this was a bad decision to shoot it. But sometimes it's just mental, as the Wolves were able to generate a few good looks for him that just plain missed without the defense having much, if any, effect on his shot. And don't forget, they got putbacks on a few of these, so those shots were good decisions that directly led to points. So missed threes aren't always bad. With the game seemingly out of reach, Luka tries to attack Towns with a step back and was able to earn free throws. And it's plays like this that get a lot of people upset when half the audience thinks he's creating contact and the other half think Towns drifted into his airspace. It also affects the box score numbers, which is crucial when trying to predict what these players will produce, and that's why you have to check out Sleeper, the ultimate fantasy sports app. What's cool is that you can set your over-under picks before the game or do it live while it's happening. Just pick at least two players and whether they'll get more or less from a host of different stats, and you can win up to 100 times your money. Okay, check my picks for tonight. I don't think Anthony Edwards is gonna get 14 and a half assists and rebounds. Uh, also, I think that Luka's gonna go off and get more than 30 and a half, so watch for that. Derek Jones, I think he's gonna grab some boards, so definitely get over three and a half. Now we got Kyrie Irving. 
He hasn't been scoring great recently, so I'm going to go under on that one. And then you got Nas Reed. The guy is instrumental, really helpful. I think he's going to go off for some more points. And then Rudy, double-double. Why not get the rebounds, get some points, get some tip-ins or whatever? Look how much money I can make if I'm right on all these. Why not just have a lot of fun with this, watch the game even more intently, and win some money? And if you use my code BBALL100, they'll match your first deposit dollar for dollar up to 500 bucks. There are so many ways to win. It raises the stakes when you watch it. So what are you waiting for? Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. Currently operational in over 25 states. Check out Sleeper today. I had to bring Chip Clark on the show to discuss this one since there was a lot of controversy. Well, Chip, we need your help here. We got a, a serious call that people are really, really, really upset with uh, on Twitter uh, all last night and even in the morning. So uh, let's just start with the overview here. To why do you believe so strongly that this uh, was called correctly? Well, let me first say this, Coach, is I, I understand it's a controversial play, okay? I get that, and I even understand why Wolves fans might be upset about this call. I believe there's three material plays potentially inside of this one play, so let's address those two first. That first one that I've heard some people talk about is a potential push-off by Luca as he's pulling back. His left hand is extended, but it grazes off of Cat. And Cat mm -hmm. is a retreating player at that point. So that hand movement from Luca did not displace Cat at all. So therefore, that's a correct no call and will be graded as such. The next part of the play is something that you and I had potentially discussed is a potential travel on that play. When we review it, we can see that Luca gathers on his right foot, steps back to his left foot, then his right foot. And as he's loading up to kind of launch up for the shot, he replants that left foot back behind him. Now, technically, that would be a travel. I don't know if this is going to be addressed in the L2M report today as a material play or not. If it is, I don't even know if it's going to be graded as an incorrect no call. Reason being is Scott Foster is the covering official on that play, and he cannot possibly see the moment that Luca gathered that ball. The benefit of the doubt always goes to the offensive player in that situation when you cannot be certain of when the gather occurred. So that's why it was not called on this play. Okay, now let's get to the main event here with the contact and how you think that, that this was decided in terms of a foul. Yeah, and so like this was very close. I liked your tweet about this last night. I understand a lot of people being upset with this call. It's very controversial. Um, you see a lot of people bringing into this conversation on social media a 2021 points of emphasis video from the NBA themselves that shows Luca himself being mm -hmm. called for an offensive foul as he overtly and unnaturally launches forward outside of his vertical plane and contacts Wiggins on a play um, that clears Wiggins out of the play. And because he naturally launches forward, he seeks out contact that otherwise would not have occurred with Wiggins. Wiggins was not going to contact him at all. His momentum was not moving him into Luca in that situation. And Luca caused all of that contact by his over and abnormal lean forward and launch forward. I don't see that as much of the case on this play. I understand why people might. For me personally, I don't see it. I see at the point of, and here's a couple of ways we can get here. Both players are closing space, okay? Luca has pump faked. He's doing the pump and shoot to try to get Cat off his feet and then draw contact. So he pumps, Cat starts closing way more space than Luca closes, okay? So that's something we need to look at as well. Because Cat closes so much space on Luca, it actually prevents Luca from unnaturally or abnormally or overtly launching forward to seek out contact that otherwise would not have occurred, in my opinion. Then the next element you look for is pause the video as soon as contact occurs. Luca's front shoulder is barely in front of his knee, his mm -hmm. right knee, front foot. So he's still simp like he's still almost within perfectly within his own vertical plane when contact occurs. So he's barely leaning forward outside of his vertical plane, hardly enough to be considered overt. And that's why a defensive foul was called on this play because Cat is closing more space. One other tiny little detail is look for the point of contact. That's what the officials are looking for on a play like this. The initial contact occurs more on the torso, the side of the torso, and there's even lower body contact as well because even though Cat lands with that front foot just in front of Luca's front foot, his lower body momentum continues to carry him forward into Luca. So if you look at that hip contact and lower leg contact, you're going to see that that cat is in Luca's space. And that's why this, in my opinion, was correctly called. And since we have a situation where this game does now qualify for an L2M report, 
we're going to be able to see what the L2M report says about it um, since it was within a three-point game at any point during the last two minutes of that game. So it's going to be interesting to see what they say. I really like the fact how you pointed it out. It's the cylinder that he's in. I know that there, if you were to put a button or a, a symbol on Luca's belly button, let's say, on that video, you're going to see lateral movement toward the basket as he's going up. But I really love the idea how you describe that the angle of his body was such that like, yeah, his shoulder is barely in front of his knee. It's not he's not moving out of his cylinder in, overtly into the player. Now, had Cat been another two feet back and yes, and, right. And Luca continued then. Right. He would have ultimately way been way out of it, probably uh, that with that kind of momentum and then contacted him. That would have been the foul. The offense. And foul. that's a great that's a great point, because that's what you saw on the, the Luca Wiggins play that the NBA used to show an example of an over and a natural launch or lean forward into the defender. Wiggins was not near as close to Luca. If you pause at the point of contact on that video, you're going to see Luca uh, leaned way forward compared to what he did oh, last yeah. night. Um, and so, the, so that's the situation where that would be an overt movement. This has to be said though. I got to dispel this myth really quickly. Um, there's so many people on here claiming that Luca should have been called for an offensive foul on this play. OK, let's suppose that we do have Luca overtly and abnormally leaning or launching outside of his plane to seek out contact and create contact that otherwise would not have occurred, like the Wiggins play in the points of emphasis video. Let's assume that that is the case. The contact, the result of the contact that he would have created with Cat does not clear Cat out of the play at all. It does not move Cat off his position. It does not dislodge him from his position at all. Therefore, in no world is this going to be an offensive foul on Luca. It can only be a no call or a defensive foul. Right. And let's not forget how uh, referees process these plays. They're looking at the defender, right? They're the, they're, he's the main action there to see what he is doing. And when you tra trace the a, a little thing on his belly button, you'd see him drifting into the airspace, landing right where, he, you know, in, in the middle of where Luca is allowed to go up. So, uh, you yeah. know, all those things factor in. Again, it's a tough call. I, I don't want to, you know, ignore people's upsetness for this. But certainly, yeah. uh, I, I think the way you broke it down is a really rational way of explaining what, uh, what happened. And certainly, you know, the way this played out, it, I think luckily it didn't really decide the game. The game sort of was, you know, decided by what how well the Wolves played overall uh, for the rest of the game. Mm -hmm. So luckily that wasn't even an issue. But uh, really important to, to break that down so people can go forward and and maybe uh be a little bit more uh rational with their uh, response to these kind of plays well thanks chip so much for breaking this down for us i really appreciate it and uh you know i'm sure we'll do another few more of these before the uh, season's over thanks for having me coach nick appreciate that let's finish up by looking at some plays by Kyrie to figure out whether his poor play was caused because of the overwhelming pressure of the defense or if it ended up being just one of those days or both to get a taste of what the officials were allowing, just check the bear hug McDaniels has on Derek Jones Jr., who's trying to come around for a handoff. Then focus on the wrestling match Conley and Kyrie are involved in, as Conley does a nice job to keep his inside arm connected while deflecting the ball with his other hand. With only three seconds left on the clock, Kyrie had no choice but to try and throw it up, and somehow Conley gets another hand in there to strip him. He then gets right into the lane when the defense screws up their pick and roll positioning, and I suspect Kyrie was surprised McDaniels was willing to help off Luka one pass away as he gets stripped in a crowd. More evidence that Kyrie was out of sorts in this game. In transition, where he's been very good so far, the footwork is a little awkward, but in real time, not a travel, as he ends the dribble with his right foot down, then a legal two steps. But this pressure by Conley seems to be having an effect. On this get action, Alexander Walker is pretty handsy when Kyrie starts the cut, so much so that he ends up stepping out of bounds for a bad turnover. Perhaps out of frustration with his poor plays so far, he makes a very bad decision to force up a contested three when the clock had wound down too far for a two-for-one attempt. He started to show some signs of life as he goes right by slow-mo and into the Gobert triangle, where he uncorks an incredible lefty half-hook off one foot over the outstretched big man's arm for a pure swish but he seemed disconnected from his normal rhythm all night. He had the entire right side clear to attack slow-mo off the pick and roll, but quickly hits the short roll instead. And when Luka collapses four defenders into the paint and throws this absolutely amazing left-handed wraparound pass on the way down from his jump, it was a little startling to see Kyrie miss such a wide open shot. In the fourth, I'd say Rudy's presence affected two blown layups, but this is Kyrie Irving one of the most creative and effective finishers in the game. So give Rudy some credit, but also we'll have to accept that Kyrie just wasn't focused like he normally is. 
It took a wild miss and long rebound for Kyrie to finally get some space to attack a closeout, and he hits another lefty pull-up floater that cuts the lead to three with a minute left. Buddy gets caught too close to the sideline as he was stringing out the double team and tries a very risky left-handed skip pass that ends up nowhere close to its intended target, either in the corner or the wing on the weak side, and it basically ended the game early. The Mavericks have to hope that Kyrie can handle the pressure better, and I'm sure that he will, since some of these plays are just not the thing you'd normally see him make even when faced with good defense. And if that's the case, it feels to me like the Mavericks pull Game 5 out and start preparing for the Celtics in the NBA Finals.